Well, my parents are uh, coming up from Dallas, Texas, and they're going to be in the in Washington watching the parade from the, the stands. We're very proud of them. They're, they're great guys. They have all worked hard, as have the girls, and uh, we know they will represent very well the Culver Academies. I'm going to remember this every day of my life. It's, it's one of those life experiences that you never forget. Culver Academy's famous Black Horse Troop is on its way to the nation's capital tonight for the presidential inaugural parade. 75 horses were put on six semi-trailers for the 800-mile trip to the capital. For the 12th time in Culver Academy's sparkling 100-year history, the famous Black Horse Troop will be back in the presidential inauguration parade. The uh, Culver Black Horse Troop in the inaugural parade. This is uh, as they appeared as they marched in front of the president's viewing point today. The Culver Military Academy, home of the Black Horse Troop, was founded in 1894 by Henry Harrison Culver as a school for boys. Culver once referred to his college prep school as a castle in the air. Since its beginning over a century ago, his castle has become an educational fortress. Frequently, the entire graduating class, including members of the Culver Girls Academy, founded in 1971, go on to college. Since 1982, the Equestrians, the mounted drill team of the Culver Girls Academy, has joined the Black Horse Troop in many of its appearances. For 100 years, Spectators, including kings and queens, emperors and presidents, have admired the pageantry and precision of the Black Horse Troop. The cavalry unit is the last to pass, just a little proud of all the celebrities they have escorted on occasions of state. General Pershing, Marshal Foch, President Wilson, and many others. Twelve times in this century, the Culver Black Horse Troop has participated in presidential inaugural parades. Their first appearance was in 1913 with President Woodrow Wilson's first inauguration. The troop returned to Washington for Wilson's second inauguration just prior to America's entry into World War I in 1917. In the second half of this century, the tradition continued with Presidents Eisenhower, Kennedy, Johnson, Nixon, Carter, Reagan, Bush, and in 1997, President Clinton. No historical event is watched more closely around the world than the inauguration of the American president. Those who've been there agree that the ideal seat is made of leather and sits on the back of a proud black horse prancing down Pennsylvania Avenue. We got on our horses and the, it was really cold and the, the horses were getting warmed up and you could see the steam coming off of them and they were breathing vapor and they were ready to go and, and we got in line and when we all got lined up in our platoon and we got our flags out, I stood up in my stirrups and I looked back towards everybody and I hadn't taken the time to look at everybody yet and when I turned around and saw what a unit we were, how big we were, and how, uh, it was amazing how he looked, because we had all these flags going everywhere and all these beautiful black horses. When you're riding in the inaugural parade, uh, you know, that is a nationwide event. It's on nationwide TV. You're celebrating democracy in America, the election of a president. And, of course, um, the highlight was seeing Nixon and Agnew up there. At the time of Nixon's inauguration, the Vietnam War was still going on. In spite of very tight security, some demonstrators managed to stage an ambush of sorts. Some anti-war protesters began throwing tomatoes and grapefruits at us, which uh, 
uh, we quelched that. We were able to quelch that pretty quick by um, flanking the horses out to the side of the streets. And of course, most of the public is not real comfortable around horses, so it shut that activity down pretty rapidly. But we all thought it was pretty funny and kind of fun, really. <laughs> Keep your dress to the right. Horses length distance. Jeff Hanzig's career at Culver started in 1969. In 1980, he was appointed director of horsemanship and held that post until 1988. He led the troop in what became known as the trip to hell. It was 1985 and it was uh, Reagan's second inaugural. And the day before the parade was slated to be January 20th, we uh, had our rehearsal in the severest of weather. It was 22 below zero with wind chills of minus 45. In the face of unbearable conditions, the young men, women, and horses displayed courage and discipline in keeping with the highest traditions of the cavalry. We had to platoon the troopers and girls. They would go and they would groom their horse and be in this weather for about 10 minutes. Then they would fall back to the buses. The next platoon would go out. Then we'd rotate, they'd saddle, they'd fall back to the buses to warm up and then we actually were mounted for about 10, 15 minutes, and then we had to go through the whole rotation to get the horses unsaddled. The parade was canceled due to the 35 below zero wind chill that on, on the Monday of the presidential inaugural. There was no crowd to watch, no TV cameras to record the event, but anyone who was there will never forget. I came back from the meeting when the parade was canceled and called all the troopers and girls together at the hotel. You should have looked at those kids' faces. They were just devastated. The Black Horse Troop has appeared in more presidential inaugurations than any other public or private high school marching unit. That's a fact that would bring a smile to the face of Lee Genelette, a genius of a showman educator whose instinct for public relations made the story of the Black Horse Troop possible. Just 22 years old and a major in the Army Reserve, Genelette began his career at Culver as Commandant of Cadets in January of 1897, just three years after the school's beginning. 43 years later, he retired as superintendent at the age of 65. Along the way, he served with honor in World War I and was decorated with the Distinguished Service Medal by none other than General John J. Blackjack Pershing in a ceremony at the Academy. Genelette knew how to make an impression. For a young cadet by the name of Alden Whitney, that impression would last a lifetime. General Genelette was the superintendent when we arrived in 27, and it was the superintendent all through the time I was a cadet, and he was a, a terrific figure. He was tall, slender, very erect, always in uniform. He was a gentleman, but he was a great leader for Culver and had a flair for public relations. Even a natural-born promoter needs something unique, something of a spectacle. Genelette found it, ironically enough, in the newspapers. He'd been intrigued by accounts of the Cleveland National Guard's Black Horse Troop in President McKinley's inaugural parade. Maybe it was simply fate. But soon after their return from Washington, the Cleveland Black Horse Troop was put up for sale. Genelette had found his spectacle. And so after just 10 weeks in his new job at the Academy, Genelette went to his new employer. Why not buy the Black Horse Troop? That was typical of the kind of thing that Genelette did. He had a knack for seizing the right thing at the right moment and uh, how fortuitous it was that he did that because it led to it led to Culver's prominence I think with the fact that nobody can deny that the Black Horse Troop had a major part in doing that. Henry Harrison Culver could see the promotional potential in Genelette's idea. However, economic realities came into play and just 16 horses were actually purchased. That would be enough. Now Genelette could prove two of his theories. One, that a horsemanship program would build character, discipline, perseverance, and grit in young boys. And two, 
the Black Horse Troop would focus national attention on the Culver Military Academy and thus help assure its success. 100 years later, who would argue on both counts? Nobody knows the exact date the horses arrived at Culver. Nonetheless, it was an unforgettable day in Culver's history. The cannon fired. The band played. And the drum and fife corps performed in full dress. Janelet, true to form, had a photographer ready to take the first official picture of the new Culver Black Horse Troop. It certainly wouldn't be the last. The country was a very different place when that first photograph was taken. America was just learning about automobiles, and nobody dreamed about car phones. Women didn't have the right to vote. Arizona wasn't a state. Geronimo was still alive. Indiana was producing more oil than Texas. The Atomic Age and the Age of Aquarius were still over half a century away. And as for the Army, the most dependable weapon was still a man, a rifle, and a horse. The saga of the United States Cavalry is the story of bold, dashing, and colorful horsemen. They understood the meaning of loyalty and devotion to duty. These were the characteristics General Lett sought in the men he would select to ride at the head of his cavalry. In 1906, he found his ideal leader, Robert Rosso. Captain Robert Rosso was all cavalry. Growing up, he would listen to first-hand war stories from Civil War veterans. He joined the Army Cavalry as an enlisted man. His leadership soon led to an officer's commission. Rosso rode with the cavalry in the Philippines. He was battle-tested and proven. Now, Genelette not only had a cavalry, he had a tried and true cavalry man to lead it. Rosso wasted no time. He instituted a series of strenuous riding tests to assure that only the best would qualify for the Black Horse Troop. It was Rosso who introduced official cavalry training procedures. He transformed the Black Horse Troop into an elite military unit with strong ties to the U.S. Cavalry. The connection between Culver and the regular cavalry was very close and tight because Culver at that time was a senior ROTC unit. Colonel Rosso had assembled on his staff uh, two or three regular army sergeants who had served during World War I, all of whom incidentally had received field commissions. So the, the staff was strong with regular army cavalry people. After their participation in ROTC summer camp exercises in competition with college students, the Army commended the schoolboy soldiers of the Black Horse Troop for their outstanding performance. For Rosso, it was further proof that the qualities of leadership instilled upon his teenage troop were in fact making what he called the Culver Man of Tomorrow. Robert Rosso served as director of the Black Horse Troop during the crucial formative years from 1906 through 1928 when he gave up leadership of the troop to become Commandant of Cadets. Filling Rosso's boots left Superintendent Genelette with a dilemma. The new troop director, in keeping with the Rosso tradition, would have to be cavalry. The ideal candidate was already at Culver, Clarence Alden Whitney. Not being fond of the name Clarence, Whitney preferred the name Jerry. Jerry Whitney had the right stuff. An army officer in World War I, already a successful career at Culver, the respect of the cadets and his colleagues. There was just one little detail. Jerry Whitney was infantry, not cavalry. Yes, my father was an infantry officer and had, as far as I know, no connection with horses. He grew up in Maine where he was born and played hockey and was a figure skater. Genelette asked Whitney if he would be willing to transfer from infantry to cavalry if the Army would agree to send him to the cavalry school at Fort Riley, Kansas. Genelette's contacts at the War Department were pleased to oblige.
He returned from Port Riley with Cross Sabres on his collar and Gary Owen, the famous song of the 7th Cavalry on his lips. With Jerry Whitney in the saddle, the tradition of having a cavalry trained officer in charge of the Black Horse Troop would continue. He demanded a lot of himself and his young troopers. Well, my father was very, very firm military stature. He walked with determination. He often said, I want those boys to think, boy, something's going on here, and when he gets there, all hell's going to break loose. Of course, he was always in uniform, always wore boots and spurs, always carried a crop under his arm, which he used to point out discrepancies, or when he saw something that was going wrong, would tap on his boot with it, which gave everybody a clue <laughs> that things were about to happen. <laughs> Beneath the spit and polish, beyond the boots and saddles, Jerry Whitney had a simple philosophy about training young boys. I can hear my dad say often that young boys, teenage boys, although they will never admit it to you, they need to be told what to do and be required to do it and have somebody follow up and make sure they did it. And this, in turn, uh, leads to a great deal of pride they felt in them, not only in themselves, but in their organization, in the case of the troopers, the Black Horse Troop. Culver was really blessed because they had some uh, great horsemen, uh, cavalry trained. Colonel Whitney, of course, who was director of the troop for so many years. Uh, Colonel Kitts, who came in in the 40s, was an uh, individual bronze medal winner at the 1936 Olympics. Um, Bob Feely, Jack Fritz. Colonel Graham, who was a seven goal indoor uh, rated polo player. And uh, during World War II, he was uh, aide to General MacArthur. Colonel uh, Robinette, who was uh, cavalry trained and Robbie, as we affectionately called him behind his back, never to his face, uh, a really great gentleman. And uh, Command Sergeant Major Hudson, who was here in the uh, horsemanship department for a good many years. To be able to ride a horse well requires self-discipline. And Colonel Sam Townsley used to say, if you can't control yourself, you'll never control a horse. Well. In my mind, when I was here at school, uh, the ideal trooper was the director of horsemanship, Colonel Sam Townsley. And uh, he's had spent uh, many, many years on horseback. Uh, his legs were about as uh, bowed as legs can get. And he walked around campus, and you could tell him a mile away. Colonel Townsley was a tremendous horseman. He was the winner of the International Jumping Trophy in 1958, Innsbruck, Austria. So these, these are the kind, these are the caliber of individuals, of horsemen, that Culver was able to attract over the years. The United States Cavalry goes back to 1776. The unique combination of two spirits, horse and rider, proved itself over and over again in America's battles Revolutionary War to the Civil War to the Indian Wars. Half cowboy, half soldier, cavalrymen remain among the most romantic and charismatic characters in American history. That image has rubbed off on the Black Horse Troop. There's a spirit there. And although I'm sure that other alumni who were not associated with the troop would probably contest this, but there's always been something special about troopers. They have a certain swagger. There's a certain uh, camaraderie, uh, much like Texans have, that bonds the troopers. You know, we're a little different. You can't wait to get out of class to come over here and pick up a polo mallet or, uh, you know, try a new trick on horseback or try that jump that you didn't make the day before. It's the uniform, it's the boots, it's the breeches, it's the yellow stripe. It's sitting up on a horse. Uh, when you are a 16, 17 year old uh, young man and you get to uh, sit astride a horse and say forward ho, I mean you're playing John Wayne. And uh, that's always been I think a very, very important part of the Black Horse Troop. 
is that the kids get to live something that uh, they may have seen only in movies, and here I'm really doing it. By the time the 20th century got rolling, the fighting days of the U.S. Cavalry were just about over. In 1933, mechanization of the cavalry began with the first tanks. The new cavalry would depend on horsepower, not horses. Ten years later, Congress dissolved the last remaining regular Army Horse Cavalry units. The U.S. Cavalry went down not in a blaze of glory. It simply became obsolete. And while the Horse Cavalry is no more, in the Black Horse Troop, the traditions of the cavalry are still very much alive. The way the students line up, the way the commands are given, the way the students mount, dismount, uh, the way they do their formations is exactly the way they were done in the United States Cavalry because we have their drill manuals. We did what they did. We studied their films. We went down slides uh, where the horse locked his legs and you went all the way down. We took jumps. We We'd go out and play tag in the forest. One time we came back with two broken bones in one day. And uh, that was just sort of a, a red, you know, a badge of courage to do that kind of thing. The Culver Black Horse Troop is the largest remaining mounted cavalry unit in the United States today. Not only do the troopers carry on the traditions of the cavalry, stable operations are organized according to authentic and very practical U.S. cavalry methods. For example, the horses in this operation are all branded on their hoof, and their brand on their hoof matches their halter number, which matches their stall number, which matches their saddle and tack, which that is an old army trick, actually, um, to make it easy to maintain uh, order in running a large billet like this for horses. Equestrian sports were an important part of cavalry life. Just like rodeo to working cowboys, it was a way to have fun and maintain unit morale through competition. Athletics also helped keep needed skills sharp and both horse and rider in good physical condition. For many of the same reasons, cavalry athletics developed in the early 1900s continue today at Culver. <laughs> Polo was first officially played at Culver in 1925. The troop and the artillery each had teams. Through the years, polo has remained a signature sport at Culver. No amount of careful breeding can guarantee the birth of a black horse. Less than 1% of the horse population is truly black. At Culver, it's not unusual to have horses remain active well into their 20s. That makes them senior citizens by human standards. It's their experience and temperament that makes those old boys, as they were called, such good teachers. They have to be patient, considering most of the students learn to ride for the first time at Culver. The horses are black, but the names have always been colorful. Jeb Stewart, the Spirit of Culver, J.P. Hooker, Duchess, the great polo pony Whitney, Alabama, Indiana, Ace of Spades, the Uncola, and Oso Negro, Spanish for black bear, the lead horse in President Clinton's inaugural parade. But if ever there was a timeless horse with a story right out of Disney, it was the stately black gelding simply known as the clock. In 1971, the clock, after legendary service and appearance in four presidential parades, was put out to pasture. Perhaps to dream of past glories. It was not to be. The clock's greatest moment was still to come.
we got the invitation to Nixon's second inaugural parade and there was debate amongst the staff who was going to be the lead horse. Well, how about Clark? Let's bring him out of retirement. So we brought him in. He got vetted. He got a clean bill of health. So Clark was now going to participate in his fifth inaugural parade. And as it turned out, you remember that they asked the Black Horse Troop to lead the parade, carry the masked colors. So Clark was going to be the first in the line of march of the entire inaugural parade. And he led the parade. We came back and uh, we kept him in until the winter months were over. We put him back out to pasture in April of 73 and in June of 73 he uh, passed away in pasture. The first 100 years of the Black Horse Troop is the legacy of those who came before. There is no clear-cut line of distinction between the past and the future of the Black Horse Troop. In many ways, it's like a family heirloom, passed down from generation to generation. And although they come from across the United States and many foreign countries, Every member of the Black Horse Troop, past and present, speaks the same language of loyalty, tradition, and commitment to an ideal. They share a unique spirit of brotherhood, a common bond undefined by age or time. We live together. We uh, ride together. It kind of takes you back to the days, the frontier days, when all there was were men and horses. If my father could return now to the academy, to Culver, I, I think he would, as he looked around and saw the troop and, and all the rest of the young boys and girls now, he would feel very proud that he'd been a part of that. There's no doubt in my mind that uh, when uh, the troop passes in review that uh, guys like uh, Whitney and Rosso and Stone, sure. And they're looking down with a smile on their face. On the parade field at Culver, the spirit of 10 Black Horse Troop generations stands in formation, tall and proud, forever young, awaiting the command to once again pass in review.